recent guest and visitor in our community, Fruitland Jackson, a blues musician. We're on campus at UW-Richland and we'll be talking with Fruitland Jackson, uh, an acoustic blues musician who's here teaching a uh, Blues in the Schools program. Uh, first of all, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are? And, uh... Well, I, uh, I'm a solo acoustic blues artist and I, uh, I play uh, a lot of traditional style blues and contemporary stuff. I spend a lot of time studying the old masters, people like Skip James and uh, Muddy Waters, Mississippi John Hurt, um, the Memphis Jug Band, a lot of the old early styles from the 20s and the 30s, and I try to keep that kind of music alive. And uh, I do festivals, and uh, I play clubs, and um, anywhere where they love to hear the music, and I also do school programs. And uh, I, uh, at, uh, in middle schools, high schools, and also do college lectures. So here at Richland, you're working with a pre-college program, and that is a group of sixth grade, right. seventh and eighth grade students? Yes, the pods. Um, yes, and I'm doing um, um, what I call blues one-on-one -on -one courses. And this is just for someone who knows absolutely nothing about the blues. They think the blues are a hockey team or some jeans. <laughs> they know nothing about blues music. Maybe they've heard of B.B. King or Kraft Macaroni and Cheese commercial, but that's basically it. And that's, uh, that's what this program is for. It's to um, sort of like a, a quick historical overview of blues music from field hours and work songs all the way to B.B. King. And then a lot of the key players in the history and the development of blues music, like uh, W.C. Handy, the father of the blues, uh, Lead Belly, who was an important person in, in blues development. And I try to give them an idea of the tree branch where rock and roll and country began to emerge from blues music and jazz and other musical styles. And when you sort of tie all those things in and they get a chance to see how the music developed, it gives them a different outlook on uh, what I consider one of America's great gifts to world culture, which is the blues. So then the students are learning uh, a lot about history, about culture, about music, and uh, even current events. Abso absolutely, and, uh, and, and they say, wow, they didn't know it was so much uh, it was so much involved in so much information. Uh, they, they're finding out that B.B. King is just the tip of the iceberg and that there's so much going on and it's so easy to, to discuss history and culture when you're talking about blues music because there's just something, you know, something about the blues that, that does that for people. And um, so that's it. The classes are going just fine and they're, they're, I'm getting lots of question and answer. And a lot of times I have to really make uh, students ask a question but I don't seem to be having that problem now. They just want to know more and more about the music. And your students here, you have uh, 16 students from Milwaukee and then uh, about 20 from Richland County? Yes. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Milwaukee at, at a school called Grand Avenue. And I think they have some kind of uh, work sharing or a sister re relationship uh, with the university. And I talked, I was there for like a week with the music class and, uh, and, and students there. And some of them, some of them have returned to come here. And I think this is a really a wonderful program where they can get a chance to see what college life is all about. Okay, where they have to assimilate and mix with people from different backgrounds and see how, and, 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 un and get a sense of the learning process. And that uh, it's fun too. And so that uh, that's really nice. I My first campfire was a couple of nights ago where they had the Blues Campfire. Mm -hmm. And I'm 45 years old, but I've never been to a campfire. So I thought that was a wonderful thing for me. Um. So you, you do blues in the schools work all over the United States? All over the United States and uh, I'd have to say Europe because when I went to Britain uh, I was asked to do some, uh, some work over there. All over the United States. I go to school districts or uh, cultural centers, um, even um, veterans homes. And, I've, and in fact I did a seniors tour where I did about 14 senior citizen homes where a lot of people just can't get out anymore. You know, and these people were around when a lot of this music was was taking place, so it was it was a learning process for me. But uh, um, yes, I do. Okay. Uh, what is the most fun? Why why do you enjoy teaching? I know you're the winner uh, of the W.C. Handy Award in 1997 for Keeping the Blues Alive in Education, which tells me, of course, that you are very very good at what you do uh, to get that kind of recognition. So you must particularly enjoy this 
Uh, why? Wait, wait, yes, I do. I, um, some years ago, I was watching um, a television program, uh, Good Morning, I think it was Charles Corral, and there was another individual by the name of Billy Branch, and he was doing Blues in the Schools programs. And uh, I just said, well, I can do that. And I've always had this, the teachers in my family, I've always had this penchant to, to give back, and I've always loved education. And so I thought, here's a unique opportunity that I'll have to share something back with the music, plus it'll help me fill up my schedule and give me something to do in the daytime. And uh, it is, has grown. Um, uh, in fact, half my itinerary now is dealing with uh, education, educational institutions. I didn't know it was going to, to be like this, but it's, it's really growing. I've got letters from the White House. I've got letters from Miss Chipper Gore about the programs, and it's a, it's just a growing thing, and it's it's exciting. I, I didn't know Blues and Schools programs are are moving across the United States and uh, on, on so many different levels. I've seen some large, uh, well-organized Blues and Schools programs where they have several artists in, and they're doing artist residencies that last up to a month, and then some where it's just maybe a one-hour lecture to give them some insights into the music. Um, what do students tell you that they get out of the program? What kind of comments do you hear from them? Well, most of them have this romance with the blues. They just imagine some old guy sitting in a chair saying, uh, singing about his woes and, you know, his car never starts and he's always late and I wrote a song, you want to hear it, here it goes. They've got this sort of a romance with the blues until they get into it. And then um, it sort of creates questions. When I, we talk about country music, or if I'm talking about rock and roll, if I'm talking about rap music or hip hop, I try to draw parallels back to the blues. And they seem to be surprised. They'll say, well, I didn't know that. And then it, it creates other questions you know, or, uh, about the music. They just, uh, they just didn't know. No one really takes the time out to, uh, to talk to them as they learn music. We always tell our children what not to listen to. Uh, uh, what we don't like, but to sit there with them as they're experiencing music and, 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 and walk with them as you talk about the music, it's a, an experience that I, that's probably new for a lot of them. Most of them have gotten their musical, they've developed their musical vocabularies off of commercial radio, okay, which is limited. And I always challenge them to uh, turn to public radio, listen to what other people are listening to. Otherwise, they'll find out that their musical vocabulary is very small. And if you talk about flamenco music, if you talk about calypso, if you talk about Celtic music, they won't know what you're talking about because all they'll listen to is commercial radio, which is just love songs and dance music. So I challenge them to listen to other types of music. And I also tell them that they don't, they don't even have to like the blues. But if they don't like it, they should at least know why. How can you have a legitimate beef unless you've investigated the matter thoroughly? So, uh, you know, it's not like you have to like this music, but it's just a matter of giving things a chance and, and giving, you know, I tell them, give it a chance. You don't have to run out and buy everything you hear, but at least be able to discuss it and have some fundamental definitions as to what the music is. Uh, some people might wonder, because many of us think of the blues, uh, sometimes people think of it as kind of low-down, dirty music, and <laughs> of course mm -hmm. really, uh, that really isn't the case necessarily, but it has that sort of reputation. And, how do, how do you approach those kind of things when you're dealing with kids? In definition, because the basic definition for the blues, as given to us by Willie Dixon, who is sort of the spiritual godfather for blues and schools, is that the blues are the facts of life, expressed musically. Sometimes life is happy and serious. Sometimes life is happy, excuse me, and sometimes life can be quite serious. Okay, and so uh, when I talk about the blues, it could cover any subject. It can be, a, it doesn't have to be the low down dirty blues, although that was a, a, a part of the blues and an aspect of it. You can sing the blues about just about anything that you want, and, um, and, it, and it doesn't have to have that connotation. And I think this new generation can see that. It's, it's, it's a changing thing, and, uh, because the blues can be about anything that life is about. Uh -huh. For those of, uh, in our audience who may not be familiar with the history of the blues, could you just give us a just a you know like a, a very brief capsule history of? Uh... Well, when I talk about the blues in the early days, I try to, um, especially with young people, is give them an idea of what the music sounded like a long time ago. 
What did the music sound like uh, before MTV, VH1, Nintendo, and CD players? Ha, uh, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, when there was no Kiss Fox 106 99 country famous station, how did people listen to the music? And in the South and uh, in places like Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia, the music, you had to hear the music live. And there were basically three types of music people were, were, were singing back then, and those were either field hollers, work songs, or religious or spiritual songs. And I give them examples of what that music sounded like back then. And then I try to go from, I always pick 1850 for no, you know, just a, as, as a good year. And then I go all the way up to W.C. Handy, which took place in 1912, when the blues sort of became a legitimate art form, where it was all right to listen to the blues. When a lot of the, uh, uh, the major bands like Earl Fuller, Paul Whiteman, and Rudy Valley began to put blues music in their repertoire. And, uh, uh, and, um, and then I bring it all the way up to B.B. To, to King and, and try to do it that way. And, uh, okay. Um, could you give us an example of a field holler? Sure can. Sure can. Um, now, field hollers are songs that didn't have any form and they didn't have any structure. No one knows when they began. In fact, when I was young, my grandfather lived to be 96 years old. And uh, he would sing field hollers in the backyard when he'd be working in his garden. And we didn't know what he was doing. We'd say, there go Grandpa talking to himself again. And I know in the state of Texas, they used to have a nickname for the sun. They called the sun Old Hannah. And on a hot day, they'd be singing field hollers and just hoping that the sun would go down. Kind of went like this. <clears throat> go down, Old Hannah. The women like they did the men. Wow. And that's kind of a feel holler. And what was the purpose? What did people do? Uh, what was it to uh, distract them while they worked? Absolutely. Well, field hollers and work songs, they, they, they're three main purposes. Well, uh, there's a little difference in there, but it was to just, uh, it was an outlet for uh, frustration and anger, uh, give you something to do while performing boring tasks. And um, it was just kind of an outlet to sing. There, there was no really instruments. And then uh, the work song was out along with the field holler. And work songs created a synchronized rhythm of movement. Or when people worked in groups, they, uh, they would use either the, uh, their work tools, like sledgehammers and pixes and axes, to create the beat. And then they would sing between the beat. And whether they were unloading boats, uh, laying railroad tracks, building roads, sewing, um, picking cotton, uh, cutting uh, cut, uh, sugar cane, whatever they were doing, they would always sing uh, work songs. Work songs were heard on by, heard on with road gang laborers and on prison farms. And the singing of these work songs would even be encouraged by prison farm officials because it kept the men and women focused on their work. And they also discovered that more work can be accomplished when you set it to rhythmic timing. And I give an example of a work song using my guitar. And every time I say, wah, you just have to imagine a sledgehammer coming down on a spike. Take this hammer, wah, and carry it to the captain, wah. Take this hammer, wah, and carry it to the captain, wah. Take this hammer, wah, and carry it to the captain. You tell him I'm gonna. You tell him I'm gonna. And um, they get an example of uh, the instruments and then the group singing is called call and response style singing where they have a leader and then there's a response that comes from the rest of the group. And it sort of made, it sort of helped time pass. And the field holler, the work song, 
and the religious or the spiritual songs of the day began to mix. They would borrow the rhythms from maybe a religious song and mix it with the cadence of a work song. Or take the cadence from a work song and mix it with a field hour, and someone start referring to it as blues music. No one really knows who, but it was just considered like a cult music or just a, a folk music of, of, from people who lived down south. And then it, 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 it didn't get its legitimacy until W.C. Handy in 1912 with the, uh, the song, The Memphis Blues, which was the first blues song. And W.C. Handy, as you know, is called the father of the blues because he published and composed the very first blues song, The Memphis Blues. And do you perform the Memphis Blues as part of your uh, program for students? Well, what I normally perform is the St. Louis Blues because there, there's a connection with the St. Louis Blues and most of the young people know the hockey team. Okay. okay? And so they can, they, can, they can sort of lock in there. But I, I do know the Memphis Blues. I've been fooling with that song. It's uh, <laughs> one the first blues song ever recorded. You wanna be my gal, you gotta give me $40 down. You wanna be my gal, you gotta give me $40 down. If you won't be my gal, your old daddy's gonna shake this town. Oh, Mr. Crumb don't lie, no, he's right us here. Oh, Mr. Crump don't lie, no, he's right us here. We don't care what Mr. Crump don't lie, we're gonna barrel house anyhow. Oh, Mr. Crump don't lie, no, he's right us here. That song was written by W.C. Handy, and it was written to help a uh, big city mayor by the name of E.H. Crump run for office, who was running on a platform ticket. And they were trying to clean up the city of Memphis. And so he wrote this song about what Mr. Crump didn't or did or didn't allow his, his town. Because Mr. Crump was going to get rid of gambling and close down all these places. And so the response in the song is, we don't care what Mr. Crump don't allow. We're going to barrel house anyhow. <laughs> so it's sort of a parody. And it was the first blue song ever recorded and published. And. Uh some of the early blues musicians that you admire, uh, W.C. Handy, of course, the father of the blues, and then later there were there were others as the history progresses. Who are some of the ones you admire? And I assume because you're an acoustic musician, perhaps those are the people who are, uh, maybe you, you are most interested in their music or most identify with? Yes, I liked uh, Udi Ledbetter, otherwise known as Led Belly. Um, Robert Johnson, the famous Robert Johnson, uh, who did for uh, for blues what uh, Miles Davis did for jazz and what Frank Zappa did, period. <laughs> <laughs> and I like Johnny Shines is another one of my favorite early acoustic artists. Uh, I like all of their early jug bands. And uh, I like Charlie Patton and Eddie Sunhouse, who played Delta, the slides, all of the Delta style blues musicians just uh, Blind Lemon Jefferson, Ragtime Henry Thomas. Uh, oh, it's a long list. I, I, I love the, the early blue sound. How did you discover this? Did you grow up with the music? Uh, was it something you, you learned about later? Or I grew up in a blues household. Um, I was born in Mississippi, and uh, when my parents, parents migrated to Chicago looking for better, better employment, and I came from a blues household, so they listened to blues in the house. And I, at that time, it was just old-timey, my folks' music, and I was a, a child of Motown. I liked the, the Four Tops and the Temptations and that kind of thing. And, uh, but as I got older, uh, those seeds were planted, they sort of exploded. And uh, I started playing the guitar, but I was playing folk stuff. I was playing this kind of stuff. It's a little bit funny. Feeling inside. No one could have told me that I would have been banging away, you know, about the blues. But um, I moved back home to Mississippi, and uh, I sort of got back into the music again. And then it just sort of hit me like a ton of bricks. And um, I was a theater major and a music minor, and um, um, I just the blues just sort of over. It found me. I, 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 it found me, and it, and it overtook me. And I just decided that I wanted to play and learn some of these complicated styles. I thought that the acoustic format was um, 
was a little bit more advanced than just playing an electric guitar with a band backup because you had to play your own bass, your own lead lines, and, 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 so, and so forth. And so that's kind of what happened about 12 or 13 years ago. It really hit me hard to, uh, to just play this music. And then uh, uh, to, I decided to, uh, to step out as a professional. And, um, and then uh, I guess the rest is kind of history. Yeah. <laughs> and when you uh, decided to make this uh, your life's work, mm -hmm. the type of music you would pursue, did you, did you base most of your learning on records, uh, on research? Did you learn from, from individuals? It's a combination of all because, uh, um, because I didn't grow up with cotton and corn and mules and things. I had a different life, but I appreciated all those songs and, 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 and what those people did. So I did a lot of research. I spent lots of time in, in a library because when a lot of this history was taking place, I certainly wasn't born. And, uh, but then my blues is what I know something about. I can talk about Vietnam. You know, if my woman leaves me, she'll probably take a 747 and not a train. <laughs> and uh, so I, I had my own life experience because the blues are the facts of life. And then, when, and then I talk about the things that I know something about. In addition to, I like to cover a lot of the old songs that people have just grown accustomed to, to, to listening to. Um, what about the influence of blues on other music? I know in Richland County we have a lot of country music fans. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then some of the young people like rock or heavy metal. Mm -hmm. But the blues is really is somehow in, involved in all of those, isn't it? It is involved, and, and that's one of the things. The blues are important because they are the roots, history, and culture of American music. In other words, all of the musical styles that we listen to, ragtime and country, and uh, rhythm and blues and soul and hip-hop and rap music, uh, rock and roll, all of these uh, musical styles have their roots in blues music. And what I do in my Blues 101 program is to try to show the students how these different sounds began to emerge. If you take slow blues, like a slow blues shuffle, and you speed it up, you get rock and roll. And country music, the father of country music is a man by the name of Jimmy Rogers. And Jimmy Rogers was also called the singing brakeman. And he, while he worked on the railroad, he hung out with a lot of blues men, and he borrowed heavily from their style, and he would sit alone with his guitar. However, Jimmy Rogers has a different texture in his throat. As I have a different texture in my throat and, and a different natural tone, I can't sound like him, and he cannot sound like me, but we both sing the same type of music. Country music was working in poor class people's music's way of expressing their life experience through their music, and the same with blues. And so, at first I thought country was like a, a first cousin, but uh, I was watching the life story of Jimmy Rogers on the country cable channel. And uh, then I knew that Jimmy Rogers was heavily influenced by blues music, and he's from uh, Meridian, Mississippi. And uh, so that sort of answered that question for me. And rock and roll, if you look at jazz, even if you look at rap music, I tell students that rap music is not new, that it's been around since the 50s, at least the 50s, uh, but they just didn't call it that. And instead of scratching their albums to float the lyrics upon, they would use Boogie Woogie. There are people like Cab Calloway and Louis Jordan who were singing rap music. In fact, 50s rap music kind of sounds like this. <laughs> with a pack on my back I'm tired of transportation in the back of a hack I love to hear the rhythm of the clickety clack and hear the lonesome whistle see the smoke from the stack and pal around with democratic fellows named Mag take me right back to the track Jack choo 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 boogie woo 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 you boogie choo 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 boogie take me right back to the track Jack and just about every musical style, if you sit there long enough and uh, if you study the music, especially if you're a music student, you can hear the blues in the music. Um, Eric Clapton's one of my favorite musicians. Uh, I like him because of how he likes the blues, because he plays the blues. But even when he does a contemporary song, if you know how to listen, you can hear the blues. There's a blues song called Big Boss Man that goes like this. Boss man, can't you 
hear me when I call? Big boss man. Well, Eric Clapton took that same rhythm and he sort of stretched it out a little bit. And then he would put a few little notes between things and he came up with this, uh, Change the World. If I could reach the star Who want down for you Shine it on my heart So you could see the truth Plan this love I have inside And it's following the same pro chord progression just took that chord progression of those three line stanzas and stretched it out and put a few embellishments in it. And people have been using the blues to create other musical forms ever since it, it, it's been here. And, uh, and uh, so I tell young composers and young writers, try listening to the blues and that might give you a basis for uh, whatever you, however you want to take the music. And for yourself, it's, it's served in your own songwriting. Uh, you write your own song. Yes. And uh, and you spoke uh, a while ago about contemporary themes. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you write music, what your themes are, um, what yeah. some of your songs and albums are? Well, I, um, I'm in the process of working on my fourth CD. I have a, a one called, uh, my pat, um, CD called Fruit and Jackson is All I Crave, which is a play on words, and uh, Being Free, and then there's, I have my first cassette, which was me playing Robert Johnson and significant others. And uh, I take things that I know something about. Um, like, for example, here's a new song that's going to be recorded. And this is not, this is a happy blues. It's not, uh, you know, where they say low down, not all the blues. Here's a song called Is That Your Real Name? Because you don't know how many people say, Fruitman, is that your real name? So I decided to write the song called Is That Your Real Name? And it goes like this. People ask me all the time, tell me, where'd you get that funny name? Is it a highway sign? Is your daddy's name the same? All my life has been this way, I don't care what the people say. Sounds like apples and oranges, but it just ain't spelled that way. Hey, Fruitland, oh, Fruitland. Tell me, where'd you get that funny name? And that great big old hat, is that your claim to fame? Well, I claim nothing but the blues, and I'm gonna say it just one more time. You tend to your business, and I will tend to mine. They call me Fruitland, they call me Fruit Loops, they call me Fruit This and Fruit That. Fiber, fruit loom, fruitopia, you know, I'm a fruit cat. Call me Junior, call me Cal, call me anything you see. As long as you call me, that's good enough for me. They call me Fruit Land, they call me Fruit Loops, they call me Fruit This and Fruit That. Fruit Balloon, Fruit Fiber, Fruitopia, I'm a fruit cat. Blues can be about anything that you want it to be about as long as it's a fact of life. Blues music is music that is surreal. It is, it is not music that is surreal, it is music that is real, pardon me. It's not the way you want things to be, it's the way things really are. It's the recognition of a tragedy and an optimism to deal with it. Uh, uh, the blues lets you know that you are not alone, that someone has been where you're going, and that everything is going to be all right. It has an effect on the psychic state and to a degree the mental health as well. There's a unique aesthetic pleasure in the blues for those of us who can feel it.